this morning at about seven o'clock. Keith, you are a night owl, late night musician. What are you doing up at seven o'clock? I was on my way home. I am so grateful and I'm a fortunate man. Hello, Dorothy. I'm a fortunate man that I don't have to travel on the expressway at seven in the morning, eight in the morning, and or four to five to six o'clock at night. My lifestyle does not revolve around me revolving around the expressway at very busy times. Hello, Carol. Ah, awesome. Glad Catherine as well. Oh, she's here with you. Hello, Catherine. So my life doesn't revolve around the expressway revolving around at the times when there's high density traffic. But this morning, I had to, I happened to be out and about scurrying about like a, a creature, a varmint. That's the word I'm looking for. So I'm doing Keith Blanchard in his Toyota Avalon, 65 miles an hour down the expressway, right? And everybody is passing me, no signal, so close for comfort, too close for comfort that if I had another coat of my uh, paint on my car, we would have hit. I mean, it's just ridiculous. It's, seriously, it's just ridiculous. So we call it a rat race. It's, it's nuts. It's, it's just ridiculous. But what I realize, and people coming up to you, riding on your backside, and wanting to push, I get it, but I don't get it. But what I did get, hello, Sarisha. So what I did get, I had an epiphany. Why are these people driving like they're in some sort of madness to go to work? I got it because they hate what they do or at least loathe it or don't like it. So what they do is they sleep in to the latest possible minute, probably hit the snooze about four or five times to stay at home as long as they possibly can. So they have to rush down the expressway putting everyone and themselves in harm's way in doing so to get to a reality that God forbid it's Monday morning at whatever o'clock. That's only half of the coin. The other half of the coin is when they punch that time clock to get out, the same idiotic behavior driving wise is happening on the highway. Because they can't wait to get home to a place where they love being to jet as fast as they possibly can from a place they absolutely hate. I got it. Hello, Tony. Good to see you, Tony, brother. I understood why people drive so fast to work because they have to get there by a certain time. Because they hate their job and they're sleeping in. And the reason they want to get home so fast is because they hate their job and they want to go back to their house, the home, the place they love being. Hello, friend. I got that. I understood that so clearly driving in traffic this morning at 7.15 to go. Oh, my God, these people are miserable. It's not a judgment. It's just an assessment of what I came to as to why people drive so crazy during these rush hour times. Let me ask you a question or anyone. If you go to Hawaii, or Costa Rica, or Bora Bora, or wherever it is, if you set that alarm clock for six o'clock in the morning because you're on vacation, how many times do you hit the snooze? knowing that you're going to go experience paradise. In fact, you don't even set an alarm. 
It's an internal clock. You know that when the sun comes up, you're on vacation. You're rip, 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 rearing and on fire, ready to go. Because you're living in paradise. And we call paradise this island that we go to because I'm on vacation. I'm in paradise. But paradise is, is only a state of mind. It's only a state of location. It's, it's where you are. You can be in paradise. Every day, many people I know live in paradise. And it doesn't require getting on the expressway, driving down the road like a lunatic because you slept in as long as possible because you hate your life. It's not a judgment. It's just a fact of the matter. Why people believe that they can't do what they love for a living and be comfortable and quote successful. Successful meaning yet abundant, but more so successful that I'm comfortable in my skin. I don't have to eke out anything. In fact, I'm going to seek in. Mm, total difference of experience. Hello, Lori. Hello, Sue. And the other half of this broadcast that came across my mind today, I did a broadcast, a presentation the night about God versus guns. Have we lost sight? Feel free to check into my archive videos here on my personal page. You'll find it. My thoughts about guns. My thoughts about God as to why we would ever need guns. If we truly believed... It's a shallow word for me. It falls short of the kingdom. If we knew our divine parent, we would not feel a disconnect. Therefore, maybe the need for a gun to feel safe and peaceful would fall away. Does fall away. I'm living proof of that. The second half of this broadcast <clears throat> is about what happened in Florida. I'm not going to get into the drama nor the conspiracy theory about Florida. Hello, Chris Leveron. I'm not going to get into the drama, nor the conspiracy theory about Florida. I'm not into that. It's not important. What is valuable is that people died. Be it the government, be it conspiracy theory, be it some black op, be it some lunatic kid. That's all irrelevant. People died. I will forewarn, if I may be so bold, to make such a claim and a statement. I will forewarn that I, I, I totally understand the schools are considering arming themselves for protection. It won't work. It won't work. But Keith, it won't work. All that is going to happen is a school teacher has a pistol on their hip. Only for someone to come in and commit mass murder for the teacher to draw the pistol and shoot the assailant dead. And the consensus logic says, see, I told you we were right and we needed pistols to protect ourselves. I don't mean to burst your bubble, but because I love you, that's ignorance. <clears throat> it's ignorance of cosmic law, spiritual law, divine law. It's ignorance. It does not work that way. I'm all for everyone doing what they can to feel warm, fuzzy, and cozy, and happy, and secure. But to what degree does that logic work and to what expense? As I said, security guard, teacher has pistol on holster. Someone comes into the school, commits a mass murder. Teacher withdraws weapon, kills assailant and says, at least we saved this many children. That is not even... That doesn't even touch logic because if you're not, if a person is not logical enough to do the research about cosmic karmic law, then they're dabbling in a belief in an I don't know reality. 
That's very, very dangerous ground. So what is the better model? Is to bring meditation to the schools. <clears throat> Excuse me. To bring meditation to the schools. I hear you. So the next question obviously is, how will that serve the purpose? The Buddhist monks don't meditate because it helps them to relax. They're doing it to drop into the cosmic dialogue. They're listening. With every fiber of their being, they're listening. To hear the divine language, the cosmic current, the cosmic dialogue. Buddhists do not go about their life to protect themselves. Jesus did not go about his life to protect himself. So, obviously the right path is not about protecting yourself. Because in the want to protect yourself, affirms to God the unconditional wishing tree, the universe, whatever you want to call it. I love you so unconditionally. Let me give you more of a reason to validate to you that you need to protect yourself. If you're a Christian, hear me out. If Jesus was about protecting him in himself in the hour of his death, when I think it was Peter who drew the sword, he would have said, kill these people who are about to kill me. That was not his heartfelt process. He said, put that sword away. If you live by it, you will die by it. The Tibetan Buddhist and Buddha himself was always about compassion. That's why when you see a Buddhist monk, they're like this. Humility and compassion. They're subservient. Same as Jesus. There is no difference. So what I'm offering through this idea about meditations in schools, and I would love to be a pioneer in the field, not for the sake of fame or money. I would love to bring this forth into the arena of school administration not only do you meditate, people, what was it, in Canada, or a group of people meditate and they drop the, the percentage of violence in their city like that. But here's the gig. The idea is to not meditate and only visualize out of protection because Jesus didn't say anything about protection. Buddha does not live in protection. They live in the spirit. In so doing, they are protected. But they're not doing from a protected point of view. They're doing from the point of view of peace. So if we can implement in the school system meditation, 10 minutes in homeroom class, make it a requisite. It's just part of the curriculum. So for those rather who are fundamentalists in any religion, it's not about changing your religion. You can tell your kids it's about relaxing. It doesn't matter. But at the same time, from the whole school, because we're greater in numbers, unity, an alarm goes up, not an alarm, that implies bad, a bell dings, and everybody goes into meditation for 10 minutes. It's common knowledge. Everybody just drops. And they go into a space of seeing themselves surrounded by an energy and a reality of absolute peace. Because peace encompasses protection. Protection only encompasses. I'm creating a force field to keep those at bay who want to harm me. Because energy always comes back to itself. Guess what, do you, guess what you get more of? More of the reason to protect yourself. If you try to protect yourself in meditation, 
you're only going to call to yourself more of the reasons you need to protect yourself in meditation. That is cosmic law. So we have to be definitively clear, absolutely clear about what we ask for. Because the unconditional wishing tree, God, source, love, Jesus, Buddha, doesn't, you can call it an apple. It really doesn't matter. That's irrelevant. Same reason why if you have teachers with guns on their hip to protect the children, it will draw about an experience to where the teacher has to pull said gun from the hip and shoot the assailant to say, you see, I told you we need to carry guns. So the plan worked. It's an illusion. You've created the experience and the monkey mind is trying to convince you that when you go to bed tonight because you killed someone earlier today that you've justified your means. I never choose to live in that reality ever. So we bring meditations to the, meditation to the schools. The bell goes off. Everybody knows that. 8.15, the bell's about to go off. They are already readying themselves for falling in. Not falling out of order, but falling into divine order. we got three minutes. They're already knowing. They're already wanting to. In fact, they're already wanting to connect to spirit. Let me tell you why. <laughs> because for the last week that you've been trying this and doing this in your class, Trust me, children are so hyper aware and connected to the divine source more than adults because they're still connected consciously. And the reason they're actually looking forward to dear Lord, we just added more power to the pie. Now they're looking forward to, you can call it quiet time. You don't have to call it meditation time, but it goes against fundamental thought. You can call it quiet time or invention time or creating time, whatever you want to call it. Now they're looking forward to it. And they're looking forward to it because <laughs> they love how they feel when it's happening. They know what they're connecting to when it's happening. They feel the power that is moving inside their little young bodies when it's happening. And it reminds them of home. And they begin to place themselves in an umbrella or a bubble of peace, not protection, that's fear-based. Peace. I live in peace. And protection is under the umbrella of peace. In fact, you get more from the peace than you do from the protection. Because in peace is all of it. Not just the peace. All peace is in all of it. Now, I do understand the idea and support the idea of having a strong arm, to use the word, of military might. That is definitely said and lo loosely. Or something that represents authority. I'm going to tell you why. Here's the difference yet again. Someone as a security guard or a watchman or a police officer, is there in the form of duty. End of story. It doesn't go any further than that. There is no emotional attachment. I'm a hired gun. Literally. Not only a hired gun as if I'm hired to do a job. I'm a hired gun. I have no emotional detach attachment to the scenario. This is what I do. When everybody comes in, they respect the authority of, not authority as if I'm going to beat you down and you need to be afraid, that you know the consequence of your actions. In the story, it doesn't tell anything other, anything other than that. Hello, MJ. There is a difference of having a weapon on your hip because it's your duty. And you have no emotional attachment versus someone having a gun on their hip who's a firecracker, trigger happy, so scared to death that does not have the training, 
but I'm doing this out of protection to protect the kids or whatever. When you are afraid, you are afraid. And not only are you not serving the highest good, because you're afraid, you are going to miss your mark. A gun in the hand of any tool, but we're speaking about guns. A gun in the hand of someone who's using it unconsciously, thinking that it's going to protect them, is what kills people. Well, Keith, it killed someone last night because to create peace. Well, you go tell that to their parents and their grandparents and the family who lost their brother or sister, blah, blah, blah. This is not condoning people's bad behavior. Guns on the table. People say guns are tools. I get it. A gun is a tool. A knife is a tool. A hammer and a screwdriver is a tool. Hammer and screwdrivers does, do not go around killing people. Guns left unmonitored kill children. They find it. They're curious. They're interested. It kills people. I am not anti-gun. I am anti, quote, if I'm in anti, to use the word, I'm anti-unconscious carrying a gun. It has nothing to do with the gun, as you would, you would always say. It's just a tool. It's not really just a tool. People who use hammers and screwdrivers, they're called carpenters. People who are usually not carpenters don't often use hammers and screwdrivers. But let's just go give John or Jill Doe a gun for the sake of building a metaphorical house as a hammer and a screwdriver would. Guess what kind of work that's going to turn out to be? Someone who's unconscious of using said tools like a hammer and a screwdriver? The house is not going to be level. It's going to collapse. Do you want to live in that house? I do not want to live in the house, metaphorically and or literally, with someone who is unconsciously wielding a tool said tool that is called a gun. All that creates is an explosion of wrath. It's just a tool, Keith. I don't know many people who kill people with screwdrivers and hammers and nails. When used unconsciously, it creates destruction. It can't, don't get me wrong, it can be used to serve. That's where the gray area begins to happen. Who is conscious enough to use it knowing that as they're doing so, they're doing it from a place of serving versus a place of <sighs> acting out of fear and killing for the sake of I'm just absolutely afraid. So I'm talking about these two subjects. Being on the interstate at 7 in the morning and 5 in the afternoon when people are driving unconsciously because they're doing what they hate. Ironically, it's the same coin with a different face. People who are wielding guns, driving down the road of life unconsciously, wielding their cars as a 3,000 pound ballistic missile, unconscious, because they hate what they do, they hate their job, and they're scared to death that they could live a better way. I don't understand it. Doesn't mean I'm right and they're wrong. I'm just supporting people and graduating to another level just simply asking the question. It's not about it's not about the carrying the, of the gun. It's about asking myself. Here's the ticket. It's a very very simple process. It's not about me having the gun. It's about asking myself why. Why do I have it? Have we lost sight? Do we believe in God or guns? And I'm sorry to say, it's almost impossible to get out the conundrum with any other answer. Are you connected to the divine parent? 
Or, or are we not connected to the divine parent? And if we were connected to the divine parent, I'm just asking a simple question. Would we feel the need for God? I don't know the answer to that. I just know how I feel inside. And I live in bliss. I live in joy. So much so that I live in this absolute state of trust. That if I'm going to die, I'm going to die. And there's not a damn thing I can do about it. Hello, Lisa Larson. Wow, singing lady. It's been a while. It's been a couple years. You and your family were here on Bill Street. Hope you're well. So I'm just hanging out for a while. Chit-chatting about a few things that have been on my mind today. So much so I decided to sit down and express it. <laughs> I don't understand it. Now, back in the day, some years ago, I would tell you, I do absolutely understand it. And I do understand it still. I guess that's just my words of saying, I, I, it's, it doesn't work. I would love to be an empowerment for schools and school children by implementing and bringing to the school administration and to the school system what would truly protect our youth in school. And it's not the guns. It's an, it's an illusion. It's to empower the children and to empower the teachers and to empower the school as a collective. The no guns are necessary. To empower them to have such a confidence and to be so steadfast like a lightning rod planted inside like Peter the Rock that nothing can ever shake me. The negative nor the positive. Because I am so planted, you're going to sway by my current. Because I have the spirituality about me that I am going to be the one that has the dominant tone and I'm going to lead the way. When you empower a mass group of people to feel this way about themselves, <laughs> shit begins to happen. Shit underlined three times. Bold print, exclamation pointed three times. Shit meaning good shit begins to happen. When a mass group of people has this kind of conscious power, people in England don't carry guns, so to speak, not like they do in the West. They're living just fine, or at least many upon many times better than we here in the West. Singapore, this place, that place. What is the, the, the most famous place in there that's called heaven on earth? Uh, it'll come to me. Nobody has guns. No one. It tells me it's a social condition. And we do have forces that are, quote, working against us. But we can't use that as our go-to. And our excuse, and the devil made me do it, and the devil tempted me. That is not responsibility. In fact, when we take responsibility to the 100th power, there is no devil of blame. Because I am in control, and I'm going to ensure that this is going to happen the way I intend as a spiritually illumined individual, whoever you are. So the devil becomes invisible, just like that. When we empower people to that level, to that magnitude, it's over. Deborah says, the monks don't have guns. There is no violence in Tibet. Violence. There's no violence in Tibet. Tibet is considered to be the rooftop of the world. The reason being, because Tibet, Tibet is all about God. Because they're closer to heaven, not only metaphorically and spiritually, but on a physical plane, they are at the rooftop of the world. There is no crime. All that being said, just want to hang out late night for a little while. Say hi to some beautiful people. Let me see who's here real quick. Brian, I hope you're still here. Heather, Deborah, Sue, Donna, Thorson, hello dear. Hope you're well. I miss you, Donna. I'm going to do a refresh real quick.
Deborah says, I wish that, I wish, I wish it could be that simple. I think you meant. Deborah, I understand that we all operate from different levels. But no matter who we are, the truth is, it is really that simple. And again, and again, I understand you may go, well, Keith, it may be that simple for you. Well, it doesn't matter. It's, it's not that it's that simple for me because I'm special and I've been chosen to understand it's that simple. That is the truth. So it applies to everyone. It is that simple, period. And it only requires those who want to get on with the program for it to become that simple for them. That's just the law. We have to get out of fighting it. It, it, in fact, it is that simple. That is what it is. It's actually simplicity at its essence. It's, it's the reason it's called truth. Truth is not difficult. <laughs> truth just simply sits everywhere waiting for to, patient, waiting patiently for it to be re consciously recognized. First, we need to take out the drugs of the system. Absolutely, Deborah. But the drugs are not only these things we do like this, like this, like this, and like this. There are mental drugs that are poisoning in the entire society. I understand drugs as you mean them. Please follow me here. The drugs that you mean, the actual allopathic drugs that people, kids are swallowing. Is that possibly a side effect and a ramification of the mental construct and the mental drugs shoving it down our throats, the brainwashing, the instillment? In fact, that is where it started. It does not start with physical swallowing, participating in drug behavior. It's because it's because we become a, we have become addicted to the drugs, the belief drugs that has been shoved down our throat. And as children in our innocence, in our vulnerability, we go, God damn it, this fucking hurts and I don't like it. And it hurts because it bumps and goes against the grain of everything of what I know to be beautiful. Because I'm still connected to the source. And now I'm being disconnected from the source by everything you're whipping my ass with. And you're shoving these belief, you better, you better not drugs down my throat. And it creates a dissonance in the, in the, in the hearts and the emotional base of the youth. And because they know that's not their nature. And they don't want to feel that. And the world begins to self-medicate. Helping kids with drugs, allopathic drugs, is only the effect. It's not the cause. Trust me when I tell you, no matter who you are, if you watch this video in the future, I understand that children, people, come onto the earth plane with a dis not a physical disposition. First, a spiritual disposition first. They're bringing in, though children are innocent, does not mean they are not bringing in karma or residual energy from another experience. You don't have to like me. You don't have to believe in the truth. The truth is not needing when its permission exists. No one is absolved until we are absolved. But it starts in the home. If a children is if, a, if children and or a child are having problems in their life, the best ploy as a go-to would be the child is not being loved enough. The child is not being heard enough. The child is not being heard and or loved enough. Well, Keith, I'm doing everything I know to do to raise my child. I hear it. That's a beautiful thing. But I ask myself often, 
instead of just settling for what I know to offer my beautiful 12 year old son I'm always listening taking in information searching on information to find out ways I don't even know about that I can raise my child not just raise my child but raise him raise him up to the golden ring and help him believe it's reachable instead of beating him down beating him down with words or spanking spanking will never ever 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 work it will never work well Keith that is not true I spank my child and they very well behave do you really want your child to live in fear they may respect your idea because afraid they are afraid of your swat they're afraid of your shoe your wooden spoon your hand that's their deterrent versus education love and support same with the guns that we talked about earlier same with the people driving in traffic like mad people get racing to a red light passing you up blowing you off the road only to come to a red light you spank your child they won't like it you spank your child a little more they begin not to like you you spank your child a little more they begin to resent you you spank your child more than that they begin to hate you they may do what you're asking but you're not creating unity unity in your family unit But my mom and dad spanked me. Look how I turned out. <laughs> Imagine how much more all right you could have turned out if you didn't get your ass whipped. Water the weed, water the plant. Whatever one you give your attention to is the one that's going to blossom right in front of your face. Psychologists and psychiatrists call it Overanalyzing the over observation theory. You deem your child to be this, you deem your child to be that, you get a second and third and fourth opinion. They deem your child to be this and that. The school system is saying, Mr. or Mrs. So and so, your child is this and that. And guess what? That's exactly what your child is. Hello, Corey Blanchard, my nephew. So I'm just hanging out late night, gonna hang out for a few more minutes. I'm gonna take a quick pause. I am open to ideas, concepts. Hell, chew me out. Get upset with me. It's okay. But please leave a comment or a question. I'll be right back. So check this out, y'all. March 11th. March 11th. I'm going to be doing a presentation at Unity Church on Walnut Grove and Cordova. Brian Blanchard, I wish you still lived here, sir. I miss you. I remember our time together, bro. So March 11th, 5 o'clock at Unity Church on Walnut Grove in Cordova, Tennessee. I'm going to be doing a presentation of my lifelong work. Everything from my book, The Divine Principle, all that's been happening to me in the last almost two years, talking to you like I am now through these live feeds, which fills me inside. Again, you, the listening audience, have helped me create a brand new book. I did six, seven, eight sessions, and I went, oh my God, I'm channeling a book. Had someone transcribe it. So I'm doing my first presentation, which is the beginning of a speaking tour. 
March 11th, 5 o'clock at Uni Church Walnut Grove, Cordova, Tennessee. And Angela Rapin, world renowned, award winning classical pianist of the Memphis Symphony Orchestra, is going to be creating a soundscape. There's no rehearsal involved. <laughs> There's no rehearsal involved. He's just going to hear me talk. And as he gets into the energy, as I get into the energy, as we get into the energy, as I get into the energy with the people and the people get the energy with us. Understand this man is a, an award-winning world renowned classical pianist. This is so delicious. I'm so hyper excited about the presentation and the fact that I'm giving back to the community and to those who will help me. Uh, inspire this new book. But I've never done a presentation with this kind of power, musical power, knowing that I'm a musician, knowing this guy is a prodigy be, beyond you can even imagine. I know it sounds like I'm overblowing this. No, I'm not. I am giving kudos to my friend, Angela Rapin. <laughs> Dear Lord. So if you, if you live in Memphis, please show up because I'm going to be bringing information down the pike during the event that's going to open up a window to your soul. Keith, are you serious? Oh, I'm absolutely serious. You can see it in my eyes. And I'm going to lovingly nudge you in you, that window and you will get a glimpse of your soul. It may last only that long. But I'll give you some techniques as it's happening to keep you in the experience longer to help it expand. But even if it only happens that long, you will know what you've experienced. It may just go and be over. You will not doubt what happens. You will not doubt it. I am that confident. But give a man a fish, you feed him for a day, teach him how to do it. You supply him with nourishment, sustenance for a lifetime. And you will be able to use what I offer in this presentation, March 11th, presentation called Radical Transformation, 5 p.m., Walnut Grove Road, Cardova, Tennessee. You'll be able to use it for the rest of your life. And you practice it. It's like lifting a weight at the gym. Practice it. The muscle gets bigger. The muscle gets bigger. The muscle gets bigger. Well, the metaphorical spiritual muscle, when you practice it, you will realize that I'm not this body. Oh my gosh, I can experience myself from here. Oh my God, I can experience myself from here. Wow, I am more larger than I ever thought myself to be. And then you will feel no disconnect from yourself, those around you, and your entire life and what you know that you deserve. Donna Thorson, my dear beautiful lady, I miss you too. A change is coming. I believe that. We are the change. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Or we are the shift in consciousness. And it's coming and contagious. I feel so blessed to be attuned to God's source, great choice of word, and have faith that we are headed in that direction. I love your optimism. And in fact, my, that, that, was an un, that was an understatement. My apologies to you. You're not optimistic. You are experiencing it and you are creating it and you're sticking that out there as a light worker. Thank you, Donna. Deborah says, Keith, what happened to you to... Keith, <laughs> I know you're writing at very fast speeds and thinking I will decipher, but Keith, what happened to you to even do this book? Question, 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 question. I wonder. What, the divine principle? Well, it was a relationship after 10 years that went bad, and I was leaning on the outside world, her, as food, shelter, transportation, all those things. Of course, when that was taken away, I fell on my face. I had nothing. And it was the greatest gift that she, God through she, ever gave me. Because I had to pick myself up. Dust myself off. <clears throat> swallow my pride. And start understanding and be willing to to hear something that even if it went against the grain of what I thought was real, truth, or, Im or possible, 
I was willing. And it's not about what I heard throughout my early development that changed me. Because that's just a story. I heard many things. And it's all different facets and different faces of the same thing. But the real thing was I was willing. <laughs> Nothing else matters. Other than the fact that I was willing, everything else is irrelevant. It doesn't matter how it shows up because it's irrelevant. What is relevant is simply that one is willing. I don't have to like it. I don't have to understand it. I don't even have to believe in it. You telling me that this works for you. Hmm. Not sure about the taste just yet. I'm going to try another bite. I did not like certain food as a kid. I understand that we have a palate and throughout our life our palate shifts. But ask yourself, simply ask yourself the question. How often did you not let yourself enjoy a food simply because there was an idea in your head? Now let me say the same thing again with a different word to create a double entendre. Food we call sustenance. We can call spiritual information, spiritual food, or sustenance. How often did you not like or invite yourself or allow yourself to eat a bite of food that you've never had because of an idea in your head, only to find out later when you try that this is not what I thought. So here's some spiritual food for you. And even though it may not be what you think, it doesn't mean that later in your life when you choose to allow yourself to delight in it, or at least being open and willing. Nothing happens. Nothing happens. It doesn't have to come in this form or that form or that form. The only form that needs to happen is being in formation in, excuse me, to be in formation or to have information. In formation. I am in formation. I am in order. When I am, God's name is I am, and God does will life forth. I am does will. Well, when I am willing, I am congruent with my divine parent. I am in formation with my divine parent. And because of, I get information from my divine parent. It is not rocket science. So Keith, how do I be congruent? How do I be in formation to receive information I can tell you all you like all I want here's the light switch and I will even put your hand on it and trust me I have my inability of flipping the light switch moments myself I do I am not so trying to surpass or pretend that I don't have my human dynamic but a person could put our hands on the light switch all we want no one can flip it. No one. 
And it doesn't mean you have to flip it now. You could do it in a thousand years. You could do it in a thousand lifetimes. You're not broken. There is no rush to reach the golden ring because the golden ring will be reached regardless. And whether it takes a thousand years or a thousand seconds, when we get there, all of our struggles will, will be forgotten. So time has nothing to do with it whatsoever. <laughs> Hello, Patty. Donna says, yes, be open. Seek and ye shall find. It is Donna, exactly. That's it. We talked about a minute ago when someone, I, I think it was Devin said, but it's not always that easy. That That is it. I get it from a human standpoint. It's not always that easy to allow ourselves to be in the ease, in the easiness of it. But the spiritual law and the truth is, it is that easy. That's what it is. It's ease. And we can't get to it because we're so difficult. We've learned difficulty as to why we can't see what is right under our own nose. Donna says, I do believe there is one truth. It is universal law and it is so simple. If universal law was difficult, everything that had to adhere to universal law couldn't do it. It's like, you're just too complex for me, too difficult. Nothing could possibly exist. Nothing could exist if it was difficult. Let me show you how easy it is. I understand meditation, getting involved, with the spirit every day, 20 minutes, heck, two hours if you want. That's an amazing path, an amazing conscious, deliberate path to be in dialogue with your divine parent. Prayer is talking to divine parent. Meditation is listening. We need to be in contact with our divine parent. And that's amazing that you would want to be like the Buddhist monk, to be in meditation and prayer as much as you can. But to, be, to begin to walk into the gate is not an arduous task. You don't have to meditate, 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 meditate to fall into the gate. Here's the noise. Here's the mind, the devil and the angel, yak, yak, yak. It's just noise. And all it takes to truly fall into the gate is this simple, simple motion. <laughs> If you did what I did, repeat what I just did, with that kind of fervor, that kind of flavor, that kind of tone, it becomes very easy to see it doesn't require meditating for hours upon hours, which is amazing in and of itself. And one could and should do that to show intention to always be connected to divine parent. But for the sake of the moment, just to touch your soul, just to get a glimpse of your soul and the essence of who you are and where you came from and where you're going back to is just to go. And you feel it immediately. Do this for a couple of months, six months. And guess what? You no longer have to consciously go, I'm doing this intentionally to fall into the space. Because now, just by you being you, you are intensely in the space. You've created an expansion. You've climbed up another rung of Jacob's ladder. The spiritual ladder. The spirit ritual, spiritual ladder. Donna says... But do we have to break free from the confines of material brainwashing? Let go and let God. Yeah, look, da, yeah, Donna, I understand the idea of breaking free. But don't let the breaking free run amok in the sense that I need to break free. Because that's the same as I talked about earlier. I need to carry a gun versus... 
I have a gun and I represent authority to bring about peace. Not because I have a gun because I'm deathly afraid and I'm going to use it frantically and kill someone and they'll go to bed at night. I'm going to justify it by saying, well, I did it to protect people. It's that is not going to help a person sleep better. Strange analogy, metaphor. But what I'm saying is we can break free from the brainwashing, but let's not do it so frantically because in frantically doing it, it keeps us attached to it. So, yeah, I forgive the people who brainwash me. Parents, peers, religions, familial, society, authority, religion, this, that. I get it. I was brainwashed. But it does not absolve us from the own karma that has came, come back to us from a previous experience as to why I was born into this family, into this city, into this state, into this country, into this race, blah, 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 as to why I got the, the spanking or the karma or the brainwashing to be yet administered to me again. It's all about the willingness to get out of it, the cycle of madness. That's why when someone does something bad to us, their karma will come to them. That's a statement we would all agree to. Now let's take it to the level of God. You want to touch God? I'll give you a, I'll give you an, a, a, I will give you a glimpse of your soul. Someone did something bad and I can't wait to be around when it does come back. I want to be there to see it. That is very dangerous ground. Now let's remove our ego from the equation and say, this person did something bad and it is going to come around. We're getting better at the expanding process because we're no longer judging them, but more stating the fact of the matter. But the fact that we're stating that this is going to come around is still not high enough. Let's take it to the highest level. Let's take it to the level of God. And that's where forgiveness comes in. We've seen many posts on Facebook with people who had children murdered only for the parent to walk up to the person who killed their child in the courtroom to say, I forgive you. I was going to say, think about that. I don't want you to think about that. Feel about that. What that is. Most people say, burn in hell, son of a bitch. But there are a few people who say, I forgive you. Point is, in that for giving, forgiving, forgiveness, not only does it let you off the hook, it goes to the level of God, to the highest level, which is, I am letting you off the hook. In my forgiveness of you, I'm actually not only depleting mine, but I'm depleting your karma as well, because I love you and you did not know what you did. In the words of Jesus, forgive them, Father, for they do not know what they do. Jesus brought it to the level of God. That's what forgiveness is. So in our forgiving of people, we don't let our, only let ourselves off the hook. We help dissipate their own karma because that's what love is. It's not about me. Can be about you. Ultimately, it is. But the worship of it not being about me is it not being about me. And in forgiving other people and forgiving the one who wronged you. Not only takes us off, us off the hook, 
but it helps deplete their karma because they are on a path no different than any of us. They're doing the best they can with what they got. Right, wrong, indifferent, violent, peaceful. It is a fact of the matter of how energy plays itself out on this arena we call Earth. Thank you very much, y'all. Anyone has anything you want to bring through, do that now. I just had to get some things off of my heart. Sue says, it's huge to forgive on that level. It's, it's absolutely huge. It's so monumental and beautiful. Thank you. Just want to hang out with you. I'm looking for a good excuse. <laughs> and you gave me one. I'm looking for my magical little tool. Brings me joy and delight. Again, in closing, March 11th, Unity Church, Walnut Grove Road, Cordova, Tennessee, 5 p.m., Radical Transformation, My Lifelong Work. This presentation, I am 100% confident. If you're looking for expansion in your life, it will do just that. Just remember, I love you. Yonaba. <laughs>